Welcome back. Welcome back, teenagers. Just want to uh, kind of do some reviewing. Um, today's lesson is going to kind of be a little bit of the freeway, but before we start doing the freeway, I want to cover uh, something I think it's very important that we hadn't had time to discuss in the other modulars. We're going to discuss right away. Now, one of the reasons why I put it in this chapter is I figure by modular five or chapter five, whatever, that at this time you would probably be in the car. So I want to talk, I'm going to do a brief worksheet on right away and kind of talk about how that's going to tie in uh, with, with your lessons, okay? And then we'll start the, uh, what we call the freeway lesson. All right, do got some good videos in here. Uh, I do have a sort of goofy video, um, uh, basically talking about a freeway lesson. It, it's kind of long, but it'll help you understand uh, a little bit about the freeway and how the how it works. But before we get started, let's go into uh, a little bit of uh, right away. You've probably been out driving already, and maybe have some questions about right away. Uh, who gets there first? Uh, person on the right, you heard these things, so let, let's sort of get into that. Module, module five, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about right away. We're going to talk, talk a little bit about four-way stops here, uh, big road, little road, T intersections, two-way intersections, railroad intersections, Four-way uh, uncontrolled, that means, uh, where would you find a four-way uncontrolled with no signs? A parking lot, okay? Um, then we got two-way stops, uncontrolled intersections, uh, blinking yellows uh, intersections, the blinking red intersection, and little road, uh, big road, okay? Now, one of the things that I found out, and I never thought this would be true, is I went to a town... Uh, it's actually in Weimar, and uh, and in the city, which is very unusual, it has no stop signs. It has yield signs as the stop sign. So think about it. Most people think a yield sign means you know uh, just you know go ahead and blow through it, do a little scan. So. Uh, you know, this little town, you, you, I, we actually do the driving test there. And what's funny is, is I almost got to hit my sort of imaginary brake in my car when they come up to the yield sign and they keep on rolling, knowing it's legal. But I, I would, I would treat yield signs as almost like a stop sign, at least coming to almost a stop, if not a complete stop and, and scanning that intersection. Okay. So right of way rules determine who yields the right of way to others. Still, it's better to avoid a collision than to die for a right of way. Yield the right of way to pedestrians crossing a public roadway. When entering or exiting private property, yield to pedestrians and vehicles traveling on a public roadway. The vehicle that arrives first at the intersection or is already in the intersection should be given the right of way. When many vehicles reach the intersection at the same time, yield the right of way to the vehicle on the right. When making a left turn, yield the right of way to any oncoming vehicles. When a school bus turns on its flashing lights or extends its stop arm, stop your vehicle. And do the same when a train nears a level crossing. Finally, yield the right of way to emergency vehicles when their siren or flashing lights are in operation. Okay, so pretty good video helps you uh, understand right of ways. So let's talk about it. right here the worksheet. We we want to name the intersection. Okay, we want to. Uh, do you have to stop? Yes or no? All right. And then what would you do in this intersection? So right here, looking at this, what would you name this intersection? Has it, 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 the little black squares are uh, stop signs, okay? Let's say they wouldn't stop signs. Where would you find an intersection like this? Could be in a parking lot, 
you know, or, or whatever. Okay. But we'll say the black squares are stop signs. It's a four way stop. Uh, do I have to stop? Yes. Okay. If there was no stop signs, no, I wouldn't have to stop, but I would definitely be treating this is a uh, very dangerous intersection uh, because you don't know where the car is coming. We're going to assume he got there first. He's going to be able to go first. All right. Okay. Oh, okay. So we are going to call it an unprotected four-way. No, you don't have to stop. And he's the first car that gets there first, so he's allowed to go first. Okay. Now, here's a stop. Here's one with stop signs. All right. All right. I'm always, whenever I come to an intersection, I'm always going to count the stop signs. Always count the stop signs because that's, you got to know whether it's a two-way stop, three-way stop, you know, so and so, so forth. And it's a four-way stop. Yes, I'm going to stop. Stop, uh, then proceed when clear. Okay, making sure it's clear both ways. Make sure there's car not coming up to run the stop sign. Okay, name of this intersection. We're going to call it a two-way yield. All right, no, you do not have to stop. But I would clear the intersection. Okay, uh, me, I'm probably going to pretty much come to a, a stop on this. Because I want to clear the intersection. You don't know how fast this road right here, this road right here is, um, and so forth. So kind of be aware of that. All right, the crossroad. Right here, uh, the name of this intersection is a yellow flashing light. The flashing yellow is flashing. So I treat this sort of like a two-way stop, two-way yield. But notice that there's like four lanes here. And four lanes here I'm almost coming to a stop here okay and what before I take off I want to make sure if there's a guy you know over here or so forth uh, uh, sees me so right in here I want to make sure that these people here see me okay and I'm almost gonna watch it I'll bet you these people over here have a red blinking light okay you would never see a two-way yield, two-way yield on both sides. That, that's that's an accident waiting to happen. All right. So treat this with uh, caution, especially how many lanes you got there. I don't think you'll, I don't think you're ever going to see a four-lane blinking yellow light. It's probably going to be two lanes. All right. Flashing your left left turn. Uh, can a can a can turn left on flashing yellow, but be aware of the cars that are coming. Before uh, turn, must yield to oncoming traffic, or if clear, make it safe left turn. So basically what we're looking at right there is just making sure that everything is clear. Very, very dangerous intersection here, okay? Okay, uh, it's going to be a little bit hard to hard to see here, but we're going to we're going to call this a uh, railroad crossing. Uh, train always wins on this. Train's coming, you yield. Period. If the li flashing yellow lights are flashing, you yield. Okay, you don't sometimes know how fast the train's coming. There are some cities where the there, there's a uh, you know uh, the train's flying through there pretty quick, you know, 50, 60 miles an hour. And so those lights go on and the train track could be on a curve. So you wouldn't see the train. You think, oh, well, nobody's coming. And then you go across there and you get stalled or something like that. So be watching out, you know, for these intersections. Uh, again, uh, if there is no flashing yellows, no arm down, uh, you can go. But again, always yield to the train. Those little uh, crossbars right there, these little crossbars, okay, right here uh, basically mean you must yield to the train all right so be aware of that again railroad intersection all vehicles yield to the train if the train is coming the term light rail has nothing to do with the weight of the vehicle um, our vehicles are, are close to 40,000 pounds uh, light rail actually refers to the fact that we have shared right-of-way in certain places with a car. We have the right of way, plain and simple. Basically, because we can't stop this big heavy train fast. 
we're not rubber on asphalt, we're steel on steel, not a lot of friction there. From my personal experience, the leading cause of an accident between a car and a light rail vehicle is people being unaware of where they are. They don't know that the train is there. They don't know the train is coming. I was uh, operating inbound from our Archives Plaza station at about 20 miles an hour and approaching an intersection where uh, the traffic crosses our rails at a right angle. And a lady failed to stop for a red light. She saw the red light just in time to come to a screeching halt directly on my tracks right in front of me. I knew there was no way I'm going to be able to avoid her. I went into full emergency brakes um, and I braced myself for the impact. And the most shocking thing about that particular accident for me was there was no impact. Um, my four car train just tossed this woman's car aside like it was a feather pillow. But that was just sheer terror. I, I took a week off from work just to recover from the emotional impact of it. It's still with me. Um, I know um, that one, absolutely not my fault, but uh, still, to hit a human being, I don't ever want that to happen again. When you're driving alongside of a train in shared traffic, don't linger. Don't stay right next to the train. If you have the opportunity to uh, pull forward in your traffic lane, as long as you're not going to cross in front of us, do so. Uh, don't stay right next to us. Um, we've got a, you know, a close to a 400 foot long train here and we can't always see what's right next to us uh, th from our mirrors. So if you're gonna pass us, pass us quickly. If not, then relax, slow down, get behind us. Don't turn left in front of me. My reaction time is pretty quick. Uh, had a lot of practice. Uh, but the train is so heavy it just uh, takes a great, great distance to stop the train. From the moment I put the key in till I take the key out, my responsibility is driving that car, and I'm doing everything I can to drive that car as safely as I can. We never know all of the risk factors that are working against us, but we can know the good habits that we have working for us. So if we realize that we want to be able to protect ourselves, protect our family uh, for the rest of our life as a driver, then we need some pretty good habits. It's like um, training or, or exercising. If you practice those safe driving habits, when that circumstance does present itself, when that bicyclist or that pedestrian does suddenly dart in front of you with that stop sign that you're used to rolling through, if you've developed the habit, the habit of stopping at that stop sign, then all that training is paid off, even in that, just for that one little instant, it's paid off. But you just have to commit and say to yourself, I'm going to make changes because I want to stay alive. And, and just do it. And one of the things I do is I sit down and say, OK, here's a goal and what I'm going to change about the way I drive. The payoff for any one of these habits is that we're going to have control over the situation. And in life, when we have control, we have less stress. And we're not going to be victimized by our bad habits or by somebody else's bad habits. So it's going to make our day a lot better and the quality of our life a lot better by having these habits. Uh, but it has to be there every single time. Every single time. We don't know who got there first. We don't know if the black car got there first or the white car got there. We're going to say they tied. So if they tied, then you got to really look at the black car, white car, who goes first. White car is on the right. It goes first. Okay, it's on the, you go by the closest right. So if I'm in the black car, he's on my closest right. Okay, on my closest right. So basically, be aware of that. All right. So the white car should go first. Okay. All right, now, let's say the white car waves you on. Uh, he, again, if you get in a wreck and he waves you on, you're still going to be, you know, uh, in trouble because they'll see person on the right. So, uh, again, the rule in the rule book says uh, right away should be given, not taken. 
So kind of be aware of that. All right. It doesn't necessarily always say the person on the right, but just kind of be aware of that. Uh, the, the, the normal rules is the person on the right. Obviously, if the black car got there first, it would go first. Okay. Okay. Now I've got a four way stop. Cars are facing each other, so both vehicles must stop. Both can go at the same time if they are going straight. So be aware of that. If one is turning left, so let's say the black car is turning left, the white car is going straight, the white car would go first because the black car is going to hold up the white car. And so the person turning must yield the right away to the car going straight. So those are basically your three rules. Whoever get, gets there first goes first. Then it's the person on the right. And then, and then it, the person going straight goes first. If you can remember those three rules, that would be uh, very important. Okay? All right, we got a flashing red. A flashing red, very dangerous intersection. So the flashing red, you're simply going to treat it just like a stop sign or two-way stop. Now notice that right here, you got big lanes. So more than likely, they're going to have a yellow blinking light. And you right here are going to have the red blinking light. Understand when you come to a stop here and get ready to, to take off, that this guy might think that, you know, you know, you don't have the right of way, whatever. A lot of times it's this car right here that comes up here. You get confused. He slows down. And then all of a sudden you decide to go. Doesn't matter. You don't go until this guy has made a clear indication that he's letting you go because you lose every single time. So be aware, very, very dangerous intersection. They're getting rid of a lot of these and putting up either stop signs or are all flashing reds on the whole light. All right. But I still see them out there in small towns. Name of this intersection, flashing yellow red, uh, yellow light. Okay, um, you know, again, be cautious. You don't know what, again, we don't know what the other traffic has. They could have a yellow, they could have red. So just kind of be aware of this uh, particular one, the blinking yellow light. Name of this intersection is a T intersection. All right, one way stop. Black vehicle stops to the uh, white vehicle does not, okay, top of the T, so the black car, car has to stop. This guy right here has to yield to everybody because it has a stop sign. This car can keep going straight through, all right, so be aware of that. Okay, uh, now we got an intersection here, uh, basically... Uh, four-way uncontrolled so there is no stop signs where would you find something like that probably in a parking lot okay um, I don't really know a lot of places uh, some neighborhoods you might find this could be that the uh, some kids got crazy and pulled the stop pole down I've seen that before all right okay so if they're both turning they both can turn so they would turn inside and go uh, making sure they, they don't have traffic. So be aware of that. All right. But again, if this car is going straight, this car, this car here must yield the right of way uh, if it is turning left. All right. So be aware of that. Motorists traveling in Virginia Beach will notice something new on the roads. Flashing yellow arrow, left turn traffic signals. The flashing yellow arrow is replacing a green ball. And the flashing yellow arrow is for drivers to turn left as they would now with a circular green. But they have to use caution and turn left once traffic clears. The city recently began phasing the signal heads at four intersections on Rosemont Road between I-264 and Holland Road. They offer a safer, more efficient way to handle traffic turning left at busy intersections. We strive to make 
the roads in Virginia Beach as safe as possible. And this is one thing that um, all traffic engineering departments are trying to do across the country is to come up with the safest devices that we can. And they've, they've tested drivers, young drivers, old drivers, and they found that universally people understand this. Here's how the signals will work and what they'll mean to drivers who want to turn using dedicated left turn lanes. A solid red arrow means stop. A solid green arrow means turn left. Oncoming traffic must stop. A flashing yellow arrow means turns are permitted, but you must yield to oncoming traffic and pedestrians, then turn with caution. A solid yellow arrow warns that the solid turn signal is about to change to red. Be prepared to stop. The signals on Rosemont Road are part of a pilot program. But eventually, the city plans on bringing them to several more intersections around the city. The pilot program would be about six months. After that, then uh, any brand new signals that would go in, we would automatically include the flashing ar yellow arrow with any new traffic signals. And then if there's any known safety problems, we would upgrade any, uh, any of those signals with the flashing yellow arrow. While the pilot program is currently scheduled for six months, if it proves successful, the city could move that timeline up and begin to install the signals at additional intersections. Drivers can call 385-4131 or email the address on your screen with any feedback on the new signals. And motorists, remember, flashing yellow means turn with caution. All right, risk factors ejected. The student must suspect, recognize, participate. HTS involves constant risk that must be predicted, analyzed, and minimized, including the effort of the driver's reaction and vulnerable roadway users. Now, I'm not going to read all this. This is in your learner part. So when you go to the learner part, this should be one of your um, uh, things in there. Uh, the worksheet that we just did just a while ago will not be in the learner part. It's just a little bit of extra stuff I wanted to get with you because I don't know if we really went over right of and I wanted to make sure you got it. So let's talk a little bit about risk factors. Um, again, you know, HTS stands for Highway uh, Traffic System. So just kind of be aware of that. All right. We're going to talk a little bit about risk, potential risk, and immediate risk. So make sure you read over uh, when you get in there. In your uh, learner part, read this part. Very, very important. It's going to probably have two or three questions on there. I'll show you the questions at the very end. So kind of be ready for that. Uh, it is not worth taking high risk uh, for little gain. All right. So kind of be aware of that. Um, this is a very good worksheet here uh, in your learner to kind of read over. Uh, mainly to, talking about this part here. I know you're not going to probably see this in the video, but again, this is page four. If you look at if you look at the back of the numbers, this is page four. Kind of read up on that. Talk, read a little bit about speeding and how that works. All right. So uh, again, um, going going through all that. Uh, again, uh, we just talked about failure to yield the right of way. What happens? This is on page five of your um, learner. So kind of read up on that. Uh, what, uh, also talk about improper turns. I want you to read up on that. Okay. And then uh, memory. Uh, driver must have the ability to predict, analyze, minimize, potential, immediate uh, risk factors. A major factor utilized accomplished by information processing without consistent memory, cognitive, or thinking. Okay, so just kind of scan over this little sensory memory stuff so you have that down uh, for your quiz. You got working memory, long term memory, cognitive memory, thinking. I'm going to have you read up on that in your learners. Okay, and then we got down here, low, moderate, compl uh, complex risk of our uh, environmentals. Read about this low risk part right here on page six. It's very good. Uh, it'll help you on the quiz. 
Okay, uh, read again, read up on page seven, the modern uh, environment risks. That's going to be on your quiz. Um, that, that'll help you out there. And then uh, risk factors associated with modern risks. These are all those uh, risk factors right here. Okay. And then we'll get into complex risks. Let's start this over. Cut. Hey, uh, this is a very good video right here of the freeway lesson. Uh, I know it's goofy and it's supposed to be a cartoon, but I've watched this video many times over the last 20 years. Let me tell you, this video is so true about the different types of uh, um, uh, persons that the that are out there on the freeway that they make goofy of. Okay, and um, if you ever got mom or dad to help help you uh, watch this video with you, they would say, "Oh yeah, I've had that person on the freeway. Oh my God, that that person drives me crazy." So it is a pretty long video, but it it is so true today as it was when this video was made in, in 1965, okay? Um, there are all these types of videos, I mean, not videos, there are all these types of people that Goofy tries to be in the video, and they're still out there in, you know, 2000, 2019, and I think they'll still be out there in 2030, all right? So let's watch this video. <laughs> first settlers landed in America, it was a vast, unexplored wilderness. Trails soon appeared, of course, and eventually became tracks or wagon roads during the westward expansion. And these finally developed into a system of highways with the coming of the automobile in the 20th century. But in just the past few decades, a new kind of road has begun to spread across the nation. It is called Thruway, or Parkway, or expressway, or freeway, but the names all mean the same thing. We shall call it freeway, but whatever the name, it is now a part of our way of life. Freeways are already proving invaluable, particularly around large population centers, but they do pose some special problems for the millions of drivers who use them. Freeways are designed for the high-speed movement of great numbers of automobiles and when used properly, are safer than ordinary surface streets. Two and one half times safer, in fact. But the freeway is a new and different world. A world which requires a new and different kind of driving by those who use it. Motorists here are bound together by certain practical rules and courtesies necessary for mutual protection. And any individual who does not or will not recognize this is a menace to everyone. However, such drivers can usually be separated into certain types, which can be illustrated by a few rather extreme examples. This specimen we shall call Driverius Timidicus, the timid driver, a shy and retiring fellow. Usually overcautious, he can be a definite menace because he does not adjust to freeway driving demands. For an example, observe the way he enters a freeway on which the traffic is heavy but moving well. Mr. T proceeds carefully along the entrance ramp, which of course he should do. Now he tries to keep one eye on the car ahead of him, and the other on his rear view mirror to look for oncoming traffic. But he doesn't really trust mirrors, and he finds it confusing anyway. So he slows down as he would at an ordinary street intersection and takes a good look.
spaces seem very small. So, again, as he would at an intersection, he stops to wait for a big opening. This often comes as a surprise to drivers behind him. And can result in a sort of boxcar effect. Now, while Timidicus watches for that big opening, let's go back a moment and see what he should have done. With the entrance ramp clear ahead, he should have been picking up speed to begin to match that of cars in the traffic lanes. His rear view mirror, plus a quick glance back, would have covered any blind spots, and he could have made final speed adjustments in the merging or acceleration lane. Now, showing firm intention, he would need only a slight change in speed, faster or slower, to slip easily into a small space. Also, the driver behind is now able to be courteous and let him in. But getting back to Mr. T, he has increased his own problem enormously by stopping unnecessarily. To go from a full stop to freeway speed, say about 55 miles per hour, would require over 500 feet, roughly twice the length of a football field, before he can merge safely. And Mr. T must start at precisely the right instant, or the gap will close too quickly, and he will be in danger of a rear-end collision. The approaching driver will be forced to slow down. And this can mushroom into a chain reaction. Causing the boxcar effect again, this time far down the line of traffic. But again, what about Tomiticus, who at last finds himself on the freeway? Blue. High speed makes him nervous and apprehensive, so he drives slowly. If he keeps to the right and doesn't go too slow, this causes little real trouble. But all too often, he strays into the fast traffic lanes. Mr. T, convinced that people shouldn't drive so fast anyway, believes he is driving safely and has no idea that he may be creating a problem. But now, drivers behind him are forced to slow down quickly to avoid a collision or rapidly change lanes, which causes others to slow down. result in the usual chain reaction and boxcar effect. And innocent drivers often pay because Mr. T does not adjust to the freeway. The delay and confusion that follows invariably frays nerves and tempers and reveals another freeway menace we shall call Motoramus Fidgetus, the impatient motorist. Call dang people that camp on the freeway Come on, come on, get going. Members of this species are usually excitable. What's the matter up there? Move it, come on, move it. Explosive in nature. Get a horse! Or highly competitive in spirit. Oh yeah, well the same to you, Buster. Mr. F usually displays an avid desire to get ahead. And when free to do so, is an habitual lane changer. Of course, a lane change is sometimes necessary, and when it is, a signal should always be given first. Next, a quick look to cover the blind spot. Then speed up and move in well ahead of the car in the next lane. Freeway pros will cooperate by dropping back a bit, for they know that courtesy is a practical rule here. But Fidgetus, in his impatience, will cut sharply in front of other drivers, forcing them to use their brakes. The same chain reaction often results. And Mr. F's progress can sometimes be measured by the path of destruction he leaves behind. But Mr. F occasionally finds himself unable to pass the car ahead. And now in irate frustration, he is apt to move up bumper to bumper, regardless of the speed. Come on, get going, get going, get out of my way. Unfortunately, Mr. F doesn't realize he's driving a potential engine of destruction more powerful than the largest battering ram ever to breach a castle wall. 
to explain, let us pause a moment, return him to his car, and see some freeway facts of life. Let's say Mr. F is traveling 60 miles per hour, a figure equal to about half the number of miles per hour added to that number gives the speed in feet per second. Thus, at 60 miles per hour, 90 feet is approximately the distance Mr. F's car travels in just one second. On a football field, it would move about 30 yards every second and go from goal line to goal line in just over three seconds. But now let's go down to the field for a little demonstration in which Mr. F himself is the subject. As he watches the scoreboard, a signal suddenly flashes. Now let's see what happens inside Mr. F. First, his eyes receive the signal and transmit it to certain centers in his brain. There it is identified, analyzed, calculated, and computed. And an action decision may be handed down. Stop! Hit the brake! The message goes out to the legs and feet, and finally the brakes are applied. If we run through it again with a stopwatch, we find all this takes about one second. Stop! Hit the brake! Now, if Mr. F crosses the goal line at 60 miles per hour, just as a stop signal flashes, he will travel a minimum of 30 yards before he touches his brakes. And even with good brakes and dry pavement, he will still cover another 70 yards to the opposite goal before finally stopping. So, Mr. F was actually preceded by a sort of danger zone made up of his reaction distance plus his braking distance. Now, imagine he's on the freeway, a bit behind and to one side of a car identical to his. Let's go to slow motion and suppose that for some reason, the leading driver decides to stop and applies his brakes here. Mr. F reacts as soon as he sees the flashing taillight ahead, but he cannot apply his brakes until here, past the point where the first driver began to stop. The braking distances are the same, and Mr. F comes to a halt this much farther along. Obviously, had Mr. F been in the same lane, there would have been a jarring rear-end collision. And possibly even others. When behind another car on the freeway, drop back as speed increases to allow for reaction distance. Under good conditions, the usual rule of thumb is one car length for every 10 miles per hour. 60 miles per hour, six car lengths. When road conditions are poor, make it a bit more. Now, back to Fidgetus. Does he drop back as speed increases? No, he's still bumper chasing. Is he alert to movements several cars ahead of him, anticipating possible emergencies? No, he's left himself no margin of safety because he uh, watch it! <laughs> Not now! Look out for the car ahead! It's stopping! <laughs> Even if the impact speed is down to 30 miles per hour, the result for Mr. F could be like driving off the roof of a three-story building. Last but not least, we have the annoying type, called Neglectorus Maximus, the inattentive driver. Often Mr. N is simply hypnotized by the drone of traffic and carried off to dreamland. Then again, he may suddenly decide that the freeway is an ideal place to study his map. You may see him enjoying a second cup of coffee. Or even getting in a quick shave while driving. 
Of course, his favorite pastime is conversation, especially with someone in the back seat. Yeah, just picked her up this morning. <clears throat> Flat out, she'll put down anything on the road. Oh, oh, oh. Neglectorous can be a problem to others, even when not directly involved, because he's usually a rubbernecker. And if some mishap slows traffic on one side of the freeway, he will jam the other side simply by being curious. And Mr. Ran is particularly careless regarding signs and directions. Thus, he is usually almost past his exit when he notices it, has to change lanes quickly to make it, and there's the same old chain reaction. Finally, Mr. Wren often neglects his speedometer and forgets he is moving at freeway speeds as he re-enters the world of surface streets. So, on the freeway, watch out for the driver types we have called Neglectorus, Fidgetus, and Timidicus. From time to time, you're bound to see one of these characters, and when you do, avoid them if you can. Yeah, and just make sure you never become one. <laughs> You see what I mean? Okay, we're talk we, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, expressway ramps, uh, how to get on, how to get off, okay? Make sure that when you go out on the freeway lesson uh, with mom and dad, I want you to basically talk about it. I, I, I want you, when you're in the passenger seat, to talk about with mom and dad, how to get on, how to get off, what are some, what are, why, why is mom looking over the shoulder, or dad looking over the shoulder, or whoever's teaching you in the car, why they're looking over the shoulder, what are some key things you need to look for about getting on and getting off, uh, if, if the parents are watching this, parents, basically on a freeway lesson, all the freeway lesson is basically learning how to get on and get off, just driving on the freeway to go to grandma's house is easy, okay, it, all it is is a 65 mile an hour lane change between lanes. The hardest part is getting on and getting off. So really work that when you do your drive times on getting on and getting off and making that smart, uh, 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 that smooth merge with traffic. And then once the once you've gotten that down, maybe increase it to a four o'clock, five o'clock traffic. Okay. Notice the, uh, the entrance ramps here. You got the acceleration ramp. So you're coming here. You're accelerating, trying to get the same speed here. At this point right here, I'm looking in the mirrors. Once I see that my spot's going to be right here, I'm going to look over the shoulder one time. Do not be staring over the shoulder the whole time because you got cars that are in front of you that you could hit. So kind of be aware of that right here. He's gonna. He knows he's got a spot here in front of this 18-wheeler, so now he's gonna take it. Once he takes it, he's gonna look over the shoulder. Now, you're gonna be able to see this 18-wheeler right here the whole time. You're in. You can see him in the mirror. So why do we need to look over the shoulder? You are looking over the shoulder for this car right here. He may decide to change lanes. That's the purpose of the over the shoulder in the freeway lesson. Okay. So be aware of that. The mirror will see this 18-wheeler all the time, okay? So that's kind of how we're uh, entering the appropriate lane for freeways. All right, let's watch a freeway merge video. Very good video, I think. So let's watch it. Okay. 
Again, uh, uh, on your learn, has a lot of st good stuff here. Checking, uh, entering the gap flow, uh, watching out for that. So just kind of be aware of that. Read up on that in your learn. Again, we got to uh, sort of get on what we call the weave lane and get off. All right. Again, you must yield to the to the people getting off when you got one of these little weave lanes. OK, so read up on that, uh, especially the weave part uh, of your stuff in your learn. OK. More good stuff right there. Uh, definitely read up on this in your learn on the lane changes in page 14. Choosing, ro uh, choosing uh, lane roadways. You got a right lane, center lane, left lane. Y'all probably call this slow lane, middle lane, and then you probably call this the fast lane. It's not called the fast lane, guys, so be aware of that. If this car is going to this lane and this car is going to this lane, who has the right of way? It is the car moving to the right, moving to the right. So the yellow car would have the right of way. OK. Uh, just the other day, I was driving uh, on the freeway. Saw uh, was in another state or no, I was in the northern part of the state. And in the northern part of state, they have signs on there. It says, do not impede traffic. So this car right here is just driving in the left lane. Once he's passed his car back here, he needs to get back over. All right. You're not allowed to impede traffic. You'll see some signs uh, up and down I-10. Uh, 35, it says, um, slower traffic, keep right. That's what it means. Uh uh, I like I like the other signs that say do not impede traffic, which means just driving in the far left lane. They, they want people to pass, you know, on the left side. OK, they don't want people passing, you know, on the center lane or the slow lane. OK, so kind of be aware of that. Read up on your lane changes and uh, uh, and, and so forth. Passing multiple cars. Uh, this is pretty good. Uh, reading up on that, uh, the green arrow shows the driver's eyes is what they're doing. Okay, the red line shows the the, the path. So basically, this guy's coming in, he's getting past the car, and then he's going to move back over. When being passed, check check uh, passing vehicle's position. Move away from it slightly. If too close, do not increase your speed. Once passed, create a space behind it and ahead of it to get your uh, good gap selection there. When entering the freeway, a lot of times people slow down right here. I want you to maintain your same speed right here. I want you to slow down once you get into this deceleration lane. Okay? And you can, you can slow down. A lot of times here on the acceleration, you see a little speed limit sign here. It says 30, 35, whatever. In that deceleration lane, you need to get to that point at that time. So just kind of be aware of that. All right. Again, adjusting your speed and acceleration lane. Again, here we have some uh, the weave lane. I like this one. This car right here must yield to the car getting off the freeway. Freeway has the right of way. So if you're in this weave lane, you got to let this guy come through. You need to slow down, but be aware of all the cars coming up behind you. So kind of kind of be aware of that. All right. Definitely read this on page 20, uh, yeah, page 20, exiting uh, expressway. All of this right here uh, in your learn, read up on that. It's really, really good um, about, uh, you know, weave lane conflicts, traffic stopping, short deceleration lanes, and very slow ramp speeds, okay? So read up on that page 20 is very good, very good um, stuff there. Again, this is just more of that highway hypnosis. I'm probably going to play a video on highway hypnosis. Um, no, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to play that video because it was played in the uh, goofy video, video. So be aware of that. It was already played. 
Okay. Uh, watch for the rumble strips. Those are uh, these are, these rumble strips are very important when you hit those. What that's telling you, you're off the road. Those are uh, to keep you awake uh, when you. All right. Again, uh, on page 22, read up on risk factors: novice driver versus experienced driver. More of uh, the NETSA system, road uh, roadside service, alcohol and drug used by drivers. We're going to get into that to next chapter. Again, more statistics on the uh, occupant uh, uh, and passengers fatality rates. Right here, uh, risk reduction techniques. So this will help you in your uh, techniques. To, so read up on that on page 25. Read pretty much this part right here. This is very good stuff here. Okay, I'll continue to the next page all the way through here on 26. Uh, very good stuff there. All right, more, more of that. Okay, again, more uh, risk management. Uh, talks about types of collisions, talk about head-on collisions, okay? I, I do want to talk briefly about head-on collisions, okay? You're coming up to a car, a car's coming at you. Under no circumstance ever say, let's just take a head-on collision. If you got to turn left and take it into the side, I want you to do that. Most people do not, at probably 20, 30 miles an hour, most people don't survive head-on collisions. Uh, something happens. They're going to be in a wheelchair. They're going to have some big uh, broken bones. So imagine two cars coming, this one going 30, this one going 30. If they hit each other, the impact is 60 miles an hour. See what I'm saying? So it all, so, but, but if I were to turn a little bit, and take it here now my my force is going that way versus that way and i know you think oh god i don't want to take it in the, in in on on my side where the door is uh yeah but the your side doors are the way the cars are built now they're reinforced and some of the cars may have airbags on the side as well so me i'm never never taking a head-on collision i'm going to i'm going to divert that head-on collision to a side collision at the last second if I can. So be aware of that. You never know uh, if that ever comes in, but hopefully that may help you out uh, in a certain stuff. This talks about side impact collision, rear end collisions. Rear ender is the number one collision. So this right here is the number one collision on the freeway. So if you get asked that on the quiz, those are the number one collisions on the freeway is the rear ender. Uh, more about space management. Uh, read up on this. This is very good. The student is expected to know uh, space management. We talk a little bit uh, at a diamond space uh, um, right here. So if this is your car, I know that's a funny looking car, trying to keep a left, right, front and back. The only space you can really control is your front space. Okay. Sometimes you can't control your left side or your right side or your behind. So just be aware of that, all right? We'll uh, talk about that. Um, uh, they give you a little see it system. Uh, I talk about it in a Smith system. So kind of be aware of that. Uh, space management zones, uh, really read up on this in your learn on space ahead, okay? It's very, very good. Uh, side spaces, spaces behind. Opening, close, and changing. So be aware of these four, three points right here. All of this right here on page 33. Okay. Now this is a system called uh, See It. I think it's another system besides Smith system. Uh, we use the Smith system. Okay. More of the uh, See It system that they have here. Factors affect response time. You know, uh, know about that. If you were watching a goofy video and you paid attention to the football field, 
by the time the guy picks up the stuff, finally goes to his brain, to his feet, says, uh-oh, car stopping, and then takes his foot off the gas pedal and goes to a brake at, you know, 50 miles an hour, you've already traveled a football field or half a football field, you know, um, you know, at that time, just by taking the foot and going to the brake, which is probably two seconds there, but you traveled a long ways. So be aware of that. More on that. Management space, multi-lane roads, uh, briefly read up on that. Uh, reducing risks and driving decisions. Uh, this is pretty good about communicating with other people. Okay, and then uh, obviously we have a driving plan here, you know, um, uh, to go out and do what you want to do in the car. And then the, uh, the questions we're going to ask. So I'm going to kind of leave this a little bit. Uh, obviously, if you're on an iPhone, it, it, it may be a little tough to read. Maybe you can take a picture of it and then blow it up, you know, snap your uh, phone. Uh, but I'll leave this on here a little bit, and then we'll go to the next set of questions. So you see uh, the questions for the quiz. They won't be in this order. I don't think so. <laughs> they, uh, but it will be the exact questions. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 right there. All right. So be, notice that we uh, right here we did talk about the side impact collisions. It's on the, on the test right here. So, you know, maybe go brush up on that. Talks about scanning, evaluating, braking. So be aware of those. Right here, more stuff. Uh, driver should visually search. That's in your uh, see it part. Okay. Uh, and then uh, basically um, some true false questions here. Hopefully you can see that. If not, go to a computer. It'll probably be better in the video. And then basically right here, the last one. The average reaction time of a person taking their brake from the gas to the pedal is what, guys? It is what? Two seconds. That is a true answer. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, read over that. Go uh, read over your learn now and then take your quiz. Hopefully this will help you. We'll see you in the next chapter. I think the next chapter is alcohol uh, and drugs, uh, and that one's going to take a while. All right, thanks. We'll see you then.